Hello and welcome back to the Knowledge Zone. Now I'm joined by another of our dinghy show regulars, meteorologist for the British Sailing Team, Simon Rao, who'll be running through how to use a forecast whilst out on the water. Please do pop any questions you might have in the box and Simon will try and answer as many as he can at the end of the session. So without delay, I'll hand over to Simon now. Thanks very much, Hannah. Um, and thank you very much for, um, for asking me along. It's always a pleasure to talk at the Dinghy Show. And hopefully this time next year, we'll be uh, doing it um, for real rather than virtual. Anyway, what I'm going to talk about this afternoon is um, is briefly how to get a forecast, but more importantly, how to use it on the water um, without stressing too much about it and without, without getting too bogged down into details. Um, for me, the first part of um, of getting a forecast is always to try and look at the big picture. Um, and, and, and I'm a big fan of looking at synoptic charts because they can tell you an awful lot about what's going on um, in the atmosphere that you're sailing in. So a few weeks ago, um, in fact, three weeks ago yesterday, to be precise, um, a few of us down here did a bit of filming on the water to show how um, uh, to show how the, the the land and the features around the water um, actually affect your sailing your, and, this, and from there the decisions that you may make um, on, on the race course. So this is one. This is the weather chart for that day uh, on the fifth of February, and this is the weather chart for um, zero zero zero. So midnight just gone. Um, we're we're down here in um, uh, in on the east side of Falmouth Harbour, on the east side of Carrick Roads. So the big the big gold blob is is is, is where we were. And if you look at this particular synoptic chart, you can see that there's already an old occluded front. That's that one here which has gone past. There's another occluded front about halfway um, uh, in between Ireland and Cornwall there. Um, and you can see our weather's being driven by this low pressure system. And whenever you see a low pressure system, you know it's going to be quite unstable um, because what a, what a low pressure system is, is air basically coming into the middle and then going up. Um, so so, so with, a, with an unstable system, you'd expect it to be reasonably gusty and puffy. So you know, without doing too much in-depth thinking, you're, you're, this, is, this is what we're looking at. Now, of course, that's all great, but uh, what we're interested in the, is the wind. And, and if you're trying to work out the wind direction, uh, a quick and dirty way of looking at it, just you know, when you're just trying to get the big picture, is um, having a look at where the isobars are, these black lines there, those are the lines of equal pressure. Um, and generally, if you, to find the wind direction, if you put an arrow across those isobars at 15 degrees going from the high pressure side to the low pressure side, that'll give you your, um, your wind direction. So looking at this, looks like the, we're going to start off with southwesterly, um, and then at some stage, that's going to veer right to either be west-northwest or northwesterly. So that's the general um, pattern of wind during the day. Um, and what we can see is that is that if you look at the general state of the isobars once the wind has gone right, you can see they're pretty straight. So it should be a reasonably steady breeze. So that's really big picture stuff. We're looking at the southwest, varying west, northwest or northwest. Um, looking at the isobars, I reckon it's probably about 8 to 12 knots, but um, you can also get that from looking at your weather apps, which we'll come to. Um, once that particular front has gone through there, then it should actually brighten up. So it, you, whatever morning cloud you have should be a lot. It should be a lot brighter once that's gone through, which is what we're looking. Which, which is what we're uh, what we're looking for. So that's my big picture. Um, now I'm big fan of of wandering outside and actually having a look at the weather. I think this is a really important part of it. And uh, whenever I'm doing a forecast for the British sailing team, I normally trundle out with with a mug of tea around about dawn. Um, and just have a look and see what's going on. <laughs> I'm often not really thinking very much at that point, but having a look is a really good thing. Your Mark One eyeball is a very useful tool. So on this particular day, I went for a, I went for a morning yomp, um, and this was taken looking out over the harbour there um, at about 20 past seven, um, about a kilometre away from the house. That was on the way out, so pretty dark and not not this patchy cloud overhead, but you can see this line of cloud in the distance, which looks as if it's which did which did look as if it was moving ever so gradually towards us, and on the way back in um, fr from that, then the cloud the, the cloud was a, that line of cloud was an awful lot closer. It looks as if it's raining over in Falmouth over there, and actually just before I got back to the house, um, I got dumped on by that thing there. So that was the occluded front. That was that front that we were looking for coming through. Um, I was curious, so I looked at the um. Because at this point, I didn't. Oh dear, I'm going to get rained on all day. This is this is this is this isn't part of the isn't part of the deal. So I had a look at the satellite images, and this was the one at seven o'clock in the morning, and you can see there's this. That's where that's the line of the front there. At eight o'clock, when I got dumped on by the by, by that by, by the remnants of that front, you can see it's directly overhead. Um, the difference in the type of picture, by the way, is that's just thermal infrared because it was before dawn, 
And this is now actual visual um, images. So you can see a bit more detail with those. And then at nine o'clock, you can see the fronts moved all the way down to there. Now this is quite useful because because satellite images are they're actual things. They're, 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 they're observations as opposed to um, a model output. So, so if we just have a look at how far that's moved in two hours, then what we can probably say is in another four hours, probably the back end of the cloud should be with us. So we're hoping that around about 1300, it'll be a lot clearer with um, with uh, much less cloud run. And that's exactly what happened, which is a, it's a good reason to have a look at the satellite images, which you can normally get quite easily from the um, Met Office website. Now, I also had a look at uh, a few weather apps. <clears throat> Excuse me. Now, it's always worthwhile looking at two or three of them. Um, and there's loads of them out there. Uh, so, 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 you know, your call as to which ones you use. Just make sure that the, the, the different weather apps you use are actually using different models, because quite a few of them will get their information from the same actual weather agencies, either from the Met Office or from uh, the US government, from um, from NOAA, or from potentially ECMWF, if you look at Windy, which is a good thing to do. Um, and you can get all sorts of high definition stuff out there. The one that I the one that I'm showing here is from the um, from the French forecasting agency, Meteo France. It's their Arome model, um, and it has it has a about a one on one kilometer, slightly less than one kilometer um, resolution, which is great. And you can see that the forecast for 10 o'clock in the morning shows that, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, coming in from the southwest, which is what we uh, thought it would be. And basically, the the wind veered. According to this forecast, the wind is going to veer right at about 11 o'clock and then settle in for the afternoon, which is pretty much what it did. And that's what all of the other models said, give or take a little bit too. So, so because because two or three different models said much the same thing, I'm happy that the forecast is is is. is I'm, I'm reasonably confident in the forecast. However, this is all very good, but if you have a look at what's actually going on here, there's an awful lot of land in the way, and that, that, that bit of land there is a bit higher. You've got high ground up there. You've got Pendennis Point along there. And none of this land seems to be making a bit of a difference. It seems to be making any difference to the to the wind barbs that we've got here. So this is when you have to start thinking about it. You can't just take take the model as gospel. You've got to start putting your own detail in. And this is what this is what I call subgrid forecasting. You've got to think inside inside the model, inside the grid. Because if you look at it in a bit more detail, if you zoom in, then then these little wind bobs here, they will tell you what the wind is doing basically at each of those red points um, any wind arrow or wind barb normally normally it's the, 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 the it's valid for the end of it for the pointy end of it so 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 you've got a forecast for there for there for there but you haven't got an, an actual forecast for there you haven't got an actual forecast for there and and this is where this is where it's really useful to actually think about it because what happens we have um it's reasonably you know, as sailors, we can think, well, there's a dirty great lee there, so it's going to be all swirling around there and swirling around there. Um, we're probably going to have a bit of acceleration around Castle Point there. Um, there's going to be gusts hitting the water and, and moving moving along. How can we how can we have a look at those? What can tell us about the gusts? And this is slightly slightly less um, less sure, but there may be there may be a bit of lifting ahead of that ahead of that land. Um, you've all seen it with uh with 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 boys and um especially mooring boys uh and um and strong tide sometimes the the um the the the, the, the tide actually will wash over the boy but it doesn't uh, go straight up to the boy and then go over it there's actually a bit of a bow wave ahead of it and it's the same thing with 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 air going over a uh, going over land there's a bit of a bow wave ahead of it and so quite often you'll find especially in summer when things are warmer that you'll actually have an a band just next to the shore if the land is steep and high, where there's very little going on because the wind is lifting up over it. So these are things which we can all, we can immediately uh, have a look at to see if we can test them on the water. So how do we do this? Well, very conveniently for me, um, nearby where I live, uh, there's um, we have an excellent um, uh, uh, young sailor, Max Beeman, who's part of the under 21 IQ foil transition squad, <clears throat> excuse me, so he volunteered um, to to take a break from homeschooling. I, I didn't I didn't have to ask him very often, um, but, but very hard to um, to come and actually do some sailing for us. Um, and his brief was that I wanted him to basically sail around the harbour on the same point of sail to basically act as a wind instrument for us. Now um, this is a whole meteorological exercise here, so we need to have a a vital piece of weather information, uh, weather equipment, and that's an energetic flapometer. Um, which is uh, obviously you need you need one of them to work out what the wind's doing. We had um we had two drones up, so my two drone pilots were Richard Beeman and John Howard, 
um, seen here uh, in the Apple Brandy stand at the Royal Cornwall show a couple of years ago. Um, and of course, because it's filming, we have to have someone in charge to call action. And that's what that is for. So with what we'll do is we'll have a look at the uh, what happens under the lee um, behind Pendennis Point to start with. We, we, we launched everything from uh, Castle Point Beach, which is basically around about there. And what Max did, he basically sailed backwards and forwards across the harbour a few times. And um, I asked him to go right underneath Pendennis Point there, to which he said, there's got to be no wind there. So I said, yeah, well done. You've thought about this. That's good. But just do it so we can demonstrate. And that's exactly what he did for us. So let's have a look now. So there's Pendennis Point coming up. He's sailing in towards it there. And it's something he's going to now go in for the jibe now. And bang, hits, hits a big hole in the wind and flops out. And that's nothing to do with Max's skill. He's very good at this. But you can see all around him, there's lots of patches all around. And he has to really work at it to get back on the foil um, before he actually reaches back out into the harbour. And you can just see a decent wind line coming in there. So now once he gets into the wind, he's fine. But it's so, e it's, it's so easy to, just to go a little bit too far to the side and get into the lee of something like that. So really, really lovely demonstration there of, of why you don't want to go um, into the lee of the land. The next thing that we wanted to have a look at was the, um, uh, was the potential acceleration zone uh, around, um, around Castle Point there. Uh, well, basically, what we're thinking is that th this happens around any uh, any outcrop of land which is too big for the air to easily go over. So it has to squeeze around the side of it. Um, and you get, a, you get a couple of effects. You normally get uh, an area of stronger breeze just just there, just, just next to the next to the sticky out bed. Um, but also, and you've got to be really careful of this, you quite often get lee just, just behind there. And often, often there's a very fine line between getting decent wind and then getting none. Um, and I've made that mistake. It does. It's a bit depressing when that happens. Anyway, so so what we have, uh, let's have a look at what we've got in the water. Now, what I have here, this is obviously drone footage now again. Um, uh, Richard was, uh, was flying the drone for this, and he's following Max in. There's Castle Point. So we're expecting the winds to be increasing uh, just as Max gets to um, be, get, gets quite close to Castle Point there. The presentation, uh, the screen on the right there, that shows the um, the track of um, of uh, of Max's tracker there, um, and the color depends. Uh, shows you the speed. Where the color is darker, for example, there the speed's higher, and where it's lighter, the speed is lower. Also, if you see just um, up in the top right hand corner of that side of it, you can see the speed over ground in knots there. So we'll start off and see what happens. So nice straight line. Sailing in towards uh, towards Castle Point here, <clears throat> excuse me. And you can see from the from the ripples of water, from the ripples on the water, that the, he's he's basically just after the true beam reacher, probably beam reacher with uh, with the with with the sailing wind that he's got. So as he comes in now, you can see that the speed is building up. And if you look at his speed up there, he's up to twenty two, nearly twenty three knots. And any moment now, he'll go in for the jibe. And this is because he's still doing this in the area of accelerated wind. There's no problem at all staying up, um, um, staying up on the foil. Uh, he's nice and quick out of that and back, um, back immediately out. So that's nice use of that um, that acceleration zone around Castle Point. There, just one thing to note: um, you can see the, in the moorings behind behind there, um, very flat waters, and there's such a sharp dividing line between decent flow and then nothing, which you've got to be a little bit careful of as well. So that's um, that's the wind squeezing around the point. Now, uh, as well as wind squeezing around points, um, the same thing happens with tide, by the way, as well. So so, so this is why, for example, going, um, I'm sure many people here have, um, have been on the Around the Island race. Um, uh, this is why you've got to be, you, you've got to work out your tidal strategies because around places like St. Catherine's Point on the south side of the Isle of Wight or, or Port and Bill, you do get the tide sluicing round um, and it's for exactly the same reason. So anyway, uh, that's, so that's something to watch for. The next thing we're going to have a look at is, uh, is gusts. Now, gusts are interesting. Um, uh, if you want to, you can, you can get an idea of the gust speed from the weather forecast. Often forecasts will tell you what the gust speed is, or, or, or if you want to um, uh, have a look yourself, um, if you look at what the, what the wind is doing about seven, 800 meters above surface. So uh, 
for those of you who, who, who look at GRIB files in a bit more detail, if you look at the 925 millibar data, that's a really good proxy, I find, for what the gust speed is going to be. Because all gusts are normally is, is air which is flowing up, um, flowing faster above the land where there's no friction, above the surface, sorry, land or, or sea, where there's no friction and it gets mixed down eventually. That faster air will get mixed down into the, um, uh, to the surface. Um, a good way to think of the gust patterns, though, is to use the clouds around you. Now, we know that it's going to be quite a gusty day because it's a low pressure day. So that's going to be unstable. So um, if we have a look at how this works now, um, this is now John's drone. Um, and his brief, uh, Rich was following uh, Max around. Um, and John, uh, John's drone was looking at the, uh, the, overall, the overall situation. So... This footage I'm about, the sequence I'm about to show you is, is five minutes worth of data, um, speed it up, so it, it only takes about 18 seconds. And, and the, I'm going to play it twice. The first thing to look for is, um, is the way that the patterns of gusts, and you can just see before I play it, you can see those, those, those gust patches on the water there. Have a look at the way that the patterns of gusts seem to come along directly with the, um, uh, the clouds. You can see them moving across the water and above it, above the drone, the drone was up at about 100 meters. You can see the clouds basically following there. So really nice example of the fact that the, the, the shape and the pattern of the, of the clouds will give you an idea of what's going on with the gust patterns. Um, because you know, what is a cloud? A cloud is a collection of water droplets held up by air rising up. Um, so if you have air rising up, at some stage you can have air coming down as well. So, so the general pattern and shape of your, uh, of your clouds are a really good indicator of what's going on in the water. Another thing to look for, by the way, is just have a look at the gust patches coming um, off that headland there. And you can see, you can, you can, if you look at them, you can see basically lumps of air, parcels of air rolling down the hill and going thump like that. Um, uh, just an indication of another effect that, that of, of, of air coming off a higher ground and it'll come down onto the, on, onto the surface of the water in a fairly messy manner. Right, so um, a couple more examples about this, not from this particular day. Uh, the, ex the, the photos on the left here were taken at uh, Weymouth um, when we had a, a couple of summers ago, um, when we had a, uh, an, on, uh, an offshore breeze. Uh, I think it was, a, a, it was um, uh, just east of north, probably coming from about 020. Zero zero. Um, and it's the, same, the, same, the same direction and pretty much the same speed of, of breeze carried on all day. It was reasonably steady. However, it became more and more unstable, and and you can see that. But just by the by the uh, by the cl changing cloud patterns, in the morning there were it was only scattered cumulus. So if you only have a few little puffs of cloud up above you, then you know you'll only have a few little gusty patches on the water. However, just a couple of hours later, this was about half past twelve, um, that same breeze was going over much warmer land. So so there was much more action of 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 of, of hot bits, you know car parks forests whatever um uh, weymouth itself just uh, just just uh, heating up and, and air rising above those so you have much more cloud coming across um and therefore the actual wind on the surface became much more uh, shifty and and and, uh, and and gusty so so so, so in just a nice example of the of the clouds up top giving you a really good clue as to what's happening with the wind on the water with the character of the wind on the water one cloud pattern which which, which, which is always a bit confusing, is stratus cloud. Um, if you have a, it's basically your low blanket of cloud, I mean, what do you do with that? Um, from above, um, you can see that most stratus cloud is, is actually made up of long lines of thinner and thicker cloud, thinner and thicker cloud. And so therefore you basically have, you have less and more wind holding up those thinner and thicker bits, um, which means that you, the, 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 um, the, 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 the air coming back down to surface nearby those tends to be in the form of pressure bands as opposed to pressure patches so that's why in stratus clouds underneath stratus clouds you'll you'll you'll, you'll often have bands of wind as opposed to individual patches um again the um the, the nature of the clouds gives you a really good idea of the nature of the breeze <clears throat> excuse me the last thing the last effect i want to really have a look at is um is lifting ahead of the land which i mentioned now this is a bit more temperature dependent and we really weren't sure um whether we were going to see any today uh, on this particular day, February fifth. So, just to explain what it is again, um, if you have uh, if you have a, a, a coastline rising up, um, depending on 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 
uh, on whether it's hot or not. If if that if this land is really is 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 significantly warmer than the water, then what happens is the the air directly above that land gets um, uh, basically just bubbles up, um, and you end up with this this big mess of 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 rising air above the land, and the air coming in from 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 the sea has to rise up and over that. And the more messy it is on land, the warmer it is on land, the further out that rising bit will be. This, however, of course, was in February, and it wasn't particularly warm at all. The water temperature was about eight or nine Celsius. The land temperature was only nine or ten, even at mid-afternoon. So, to be honest, we weren't really expecting very much. So let's have a, let's have a look at what, what what did happen. So this is again uh, looking at uh, from the, the image from John's drone, and if you look at the wind patterns there, there's not an awful lot of difference from there to there. It looks as if the wind is just flowing pretty much directly on um, uh, onto land. It's also great water quality, which is another good reason to live down here. Um, uh, and if we have a look, I, I did. I asked Max to uh, to basically um, come in and uh, jibe around as close to shore as he could before he lost the wind, and um, he certainly did that. Uh, so he, here he is. He's coming. Uh, the drone is now above. Um, this is Richard's drone, and he was coming into shore now. So let's have a look. So flying in at 22 knots. And uh, still coming in, still coming in, still coming in, still coming in. Yeah, no loss of wind here. It just starts to bear away into the dry ground about now. And if you look on the left-hand side there, you can see just how close he got to shore. And that is someone who knows his local waters there. Um, he couldn't have got any close to shore there. He hardly, there was really no loss of wind speed at all. So this is a nice indicator that at uh, this time of year, when it's colder, um, with not much change in temperature between the land and the sea, um, you're less likely to have the wind lifting up and over the land ahead of it. Um, I guess in, in the last couple of years, the best example I've seen of, of um, in a race of, of, of that air rising up over the land ahead of it is, was the Around the Island race, um, uh, the last one that was held in 2019. Um, and for those of you that were there, um, it went round. You, you remember that uh, the southeast side of the of the island in the afternoon was, was very, very patchy, and more patchy the further in you went. Um, this is the view looking along that southeast um, uh, side of the island, uh, looking at uh, Bembridge down and Culver down there. And it was a very hot day that day. Um, the sea the sea was reasonably warm. It was about 18, 19 Celsius, and the land, the, the, the surface temperature of the land was up to 25, 27. It was a really warm day, lovely, beautiful day. Um, and so that, of course, made the boundary layer, and the boundary layer is the bit of the Earth's atmosphere that's directly affected by surface friction. Um, that was quite deep because um, uh, because you've got all this warm air rising up from the, from the surface of the of the island. So basically what happened there was that you had this massive area inshore where it was really patchy. So that lifting that lifting um, ahead, of, ahead of the land is much likely more likely to take place um, on a warm day in the summer. So that's really that's really pretty much pretty much it. Um, just to sum everything up, uh, when you're getting your forecast, have a look at the big picture first of all. If it's a, if it's an, ideally use a synoptic chart with satellite images. Um, if it's a low pressure system, it's going to be more unstable. If it's a high pressure system, it's going to be more more um, um, more stable uh, and probably a bit steadier. Physically look at what's coming in. This is a perfect opportunity to grab a cup of tea or coffee, go outside, um, go up on deck, and just have a look. At, just look to windward, see what's coming your way, and uh, and just try and put it into context with what you've seen on the chart. Then, of course, look at um, two or three more detailed models. Now, there's lots of different apps there, um, and I see we've got a couple of questions coming in. Um, uh, so, so we'll uh, I'll, um, I'll, I'll answer that shortly um but look at two or three different models just to see if all of them say the same thing great you've got good good confidence in your forecast if they all say three completely different things well then you know the forecast is uncertain which is in itself good information to have um then think subgrid because don't forget those are however detailed the weather model looks it's not going to pick up things like small lees like accelerations around points it's not going to tell you where the gusts are and it certainly won't tell you whether you, whether whether, you, whether your wind is lifting up and over land that's going on shore to. So have a quick think about those. When you're on the water, with the, the, the thoughts that you had before, just look around and, uh, and 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 see if what you thought of beforehand is actually playing out. If it's a marginal decision, and if you have time before the start, go and have a look, because um, that will actually give you a little bit more confidence in, in how far left and right you can go, or, or what your strategy is, or whatever conclusions you, you, you've brought from that. Um, and then, of course, the whole point of this is to keep your head on the boat and smash the race and have fun. 
right well that's um that's pretty much it for this now um questions please thank you very much thank you simon i think that was really informative and almost kind of a little playbook for anyone who plans to be racing in falmouth harbour this summer <laughs> We do have a question from Philippa, who says she has six apps on her phone for weather and they're all different. Which <laughs> app would you recommend? Well, there's loads out there, um, and as you've demonstrated on your phone. I think for, for all of them, for all of them, um, have, a look at, uh, have a look at where they get the data from. Uh, and that will normally be um, either uh, the Met Office, uh, if you're lucky, um, uh, an organization called ECMWF, which is based near Reading, um, or NOAA, the US version of the Met Office, so the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. Um, all, all, all the main, all the main, all the main weather apps, you know, uh, predict wind, wind guru, um, magic seaweed, all that. They, they'll always start off with those, and then do their own processing on after that. But so whichever, whichever app you have, have a look into their frequently asked questions thing, because those should be on. Those questions should be answered there. Where do they get the data from, and what do they do? And also, how old is it? Because sometimes, uh, sometimes for the more detailed stuff, they'll use data which is more than 12 hours old. And if you're doing a detailed forecast uh, uh, for for that day on data that's more than 12 hours old, it's it's a bit dodgy. And a question from Luke: Do the same principles apply to reservoir inland sailing as opposed to on the sea? Yeah, very much so. Yeah, weather's weather. Uh, uh, in fact, it's almost almost more important um, um, uh, for for inland sailing because, of course, you've got land everywhere, haven't you? So it's really important to look up wind um, and see which what type of land uh, is, uh, is 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 that air coming off? Is, is if it's coming down a, down a valley, for example, you're up in the Lake District, then it's probably going to come straight down there. If 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 it's slightly more open, then do you have big clumps of trees? That, that, that may form a bit more of a lee with, with a bit of acceleration aside, that sort of thing. But these principles will work anyway. Thank you so much, Simon. That was a really great session. And again, we all just can't wait to get back out on the water when as soon as we can. OK, everyone, we've now reached the end of day one of the RYA Dinghy Show. We hope you've had a fantastic day. There's plenty more to watch tomorrow on both stages. And of course, all of our exhibitors will be back in the halls ready to chat to you all. So have a great evening and we'll see you back here tomorrow.